Well, good evening. I'm privileged to welcome you to this evening's lectureship, the Ravi Zacharias International Ministries lectureship here at Trinity International University. Thank you all for coming. I know that some of you have come uh, from out of state, uh, from other colleges in the area, and uh, we are just thrilled to be able to host this kind of an event that has uh, found this kind of a response in the area here, and uh, that's no surprise when you consider the speaker that we have tonight. Um, this is a, a lectureship that we will sponsor each year in part of the partnership between Trinity and RZIM. And uh, these days, we're especially privileged to welcome to our campus two outstanding speakers this year, Dr. Oz Guinness, who spoke to us this morning, and then our speaker tonight, Dr. Ravi Zacharias. Uh, we began this morning with a lecture from Dr. Guinness speaking in our university chapel. Of course, we'll continue tonight. And then tomorrow morning, uh, Dr. Zacharias will address us here again at 11 o'clock in this chapel. And uh, then tomorrow afternoon, we'll hear again from Dr. Guinness. And he'll be speaking to the topic, The Good Life or the Life with Goods, Recognizing and Resisting the Challenge of Consumerism. And that will be then tomorrow afternoon at 3 p.m. here in the chapel. For those of you who like to plan ahead, so I just probably excluded everybody under 30. Um, for those of you who do like to plan ahead, I'll, I'll, I'll catch it for that, I'm sorry. Um, next year about this time, we will be having for the RZIM lectureship, uh, Dr. John Lennox of Oxford University. And for those of you who follow apologetics, you'll know that he's not only an outstanding uh, mathematician, uh, and, uh, uh, but he is a brilliant apologist and a, quite a Bible teacher as well. And he has debated uh, such folks as Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens. And so he'll be with us a year from now. So you might want to be looking out for announcements relating to that event. Well, before I introduce our speaker, uh, we're going to ask uh, the president of Trinity International University, Dr. Craig Williford, to come and open our evening in prayer. Would you please stand with us? Allow me to give my greetings as well. If you are a guest, I hope that you will encounter the person of Jesus Christ and the warmth of the fellowship of the Trinity, Trinity Learning Community uh, this evening and uh, other times when you're here as our guest. <clears throat> Heavenly Creator, we thank you that you and your sovereign wisdom decided to reach out to us, your creation, through the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and brought us back into fellowship with you through his sacrifice, his love, his obedience, his death and resurrection. Tonight as we celebrate that and as we reflect upon what it is that you have laid upon Ravi's mind to share with us, we pray that you will be present with us in a powerful way, help us to hear and to receive your word, and then to respond appropriately to that revelation that we receive from you uh, through Dr. Zacharias. Bless him, give him strength, give him clarity, give him a connection to us as we share this evening together for your glory and your honor in Christ's name, amen. amen. Thank you, you may be seated. Well, our speaker tonight, of course, is truly somebody who needs no introduction. You are all here because you know who our speaker is and have come to appreciate his remarkable gifts and ability to communicate truth into our contemporary culture. Certainly one of the most respected uh, and widely sought after Christian apologists of our time. He's traveled the world addressing universities, business people, uh, government leaders at the highest levels. His weekly radio program, Let My People Think, is broadcast in over 1,700 outlets worldwide. Think of that. Uh, he's authored numerous books, most recently, Why Jesus, which examines our irrepressible spiritual hungers and how we have lost our way. Quoting from Dr. Zacharias, this book is about the deep, irrepressible spiritual hungers we all have. We long both for an escape from the world around us and for solace within us. Our world extracts too much from us. Where does one find replenishment and ultimate meaning, especially in a world that mass markets numerous paths to truth? And I'm sure we'll hear some thoughts about those questions tonight. In addition to his writing and uh, research, he is a senior research fellow at Wycliffe Hall in Oxford, England. He holds honorary doctorates from Houghton College, from Tyndall College and Seminary in Toronto, 
and from Asbury College, and then of course very dear to us, he is an alumnus of Trinity Evangelical Divinity School where he earned the Master of Divinity. He resides with his wife, Margie, in Atlanta, Georgia. Now tonight, after he speaks to us, there will be opportunity for question and answer. And uh, I'll just say, uh, in advance, we would ask you, what, um, after Dr. Rosarius has finished his, his talk, we have microphones in the front, to the left and the right of these two outside aisles, and to just, uh, at that time when he invites questions, to step up to the microphone, uh, just tell us your name, and then please concisely formulate a question. Um, uh, so that uh, the most possible people can ask questions. Well, the topic tonight is the gospel in light of new spirituality. And so will you please welcome with me back to Trinity's campus, Dr. Ravi Zacharias. I really wish I could say this task becomes easier as the years go by, but it, it doesn't. And as I look at Oz Guinness sitting there, I wish it were you up here and me down there. Uh, I would be much happier with it, like the little kid who went to camp and said, Dear Mom, there are 53 campers in here. I wish there were only 52. Uh, it would be nicer to be sitting down there listening. Uh, I'm really taking some thoughts out of my latest book called Why Jesus? Uh, I had originally given it the nice title of From Oprah to Chopra, but uh, <laughs> somehow Hashat Books didn't like that, so I just snuck that in as one of my chapters in there with that title. They wanted something more dignified, so they called it Why Jesus with that mouthful of a subtitle, Rediscovering His Truth in an Age of Mass Marketed Spirituality. So if anybody goes looking for the book with the subtitle, they will never find it uh, with that long two-liner. But the whole scheme of uh, the new spirituality, oftentimes it's even hard to capture it in a phrase. Uh, people like Elizabeth Lesser, who are defenders of the new spirituality, resent the title of New Age Spirituality. She doesn't like that. She's not even comfortable with the new spirituality. She wants to call it the 21st century spirituality. So it depends on which way you're headed in that. Uh, Deepak Chopra, for example, although all of his thinking is uh, gleaned almost entirely from the Advaita philosophy of non-dualistic Hinduism. Uh, he doesn't like to call it Hinduism. He'd rather call it Sanatan Dharma, which literally means the eternal religion or the pure religion. Not to say that it makes it very difficult to attack because you first got to learn how to pronounce it. So that's the way he goes and Hindu scholars take issue with him. But this kind of jelly-like substance that's very hard to nail and really identify, uh, it's a confluence of an awful lot of thinking that has gone on all the way from the times of the Neoplatonists uh, through to the Chinese thought in Taoism and Hindu thought in Buddhism, although sometimes there are more strands of Zen than there are of Hindu philosophy in it. And you come up to the modern times when Deepak Chopra likes to wed it to quantum theory and wellness philosophy with his medical background. So you've got sort of a, a combination of so many of these things coming together uh, under this uh, rubric of uh, so-called Eastern spirituality. I spent a lot of time researching it, studying it, and bringing it together to try to give it its fairest look, what it is that they are really affirming, and in the light of that, present the contradistinctives of the Christian faith, how it really does stand out. Uh, let me start off on a lighter note, and some of you may be familiar with this story about this little guy who uh, wanted uh, a bicycle for his birthday, but didn't know how to pray properly for it. So he tuned into the television sets and started watching Christian programming. And after watching some very traditional versions of it, he got on his knees and he said, Almighty and eternal God, if it is in your everlasting will, I would like to get a bicycle for my birthday. And if possible, I'd like to have it as soon as possible, world without end. Amen. <laughs> and when he woke up the next morning, there was no bicycle. So he got on his knees again after watching another program and he said, Dear Jesus, I declare my need for a bicycle, that it should be blue, 
and here by 5.30 tomorrow morning. He wakes up and there was no bicycle and he was walking around the house and his mother saw him rummaging around. She saw a statue of May and Mary being lifted from one of the rooms, tucked under his arms, and he disappears into the woods. He comes back about 15 minutes later without that statue. He gets on his knees and he says, Dear Jesus, if you want to see your mother again. <laughs> You know, if people were to deduce what a worldview believes, judging by the way we pray or by the way we carry on in our ceremonies, it would be amazing to ask a total agnostic on these things what it is the Christian really believes, what it is the Hindu really believes. I don't think you will ever find a systematic theology on Hinduism because it is very hard to systematize. And even Buddhism, if you go through the various strands of Buddhism, some of it, for example, in Thailand, which is more animistic than anything else, very hard to even find a connection with that to the teachings of Gautama Buddha. Leave alone the fact that the ethical practices of many of these cultures are so far afield from what these ethical theories actually propounded. When I look at the task of apologetics, many, many years ago, I put together a simple grid for myself. It's not comprehensive, but this is the way I sort of examine a worldview in my own thinking when I'm looking at another worldview or examining my own or being, it's being scrutinized by somebody. I call it the three, four, five grid that encompasses much of the apologetic task. Number three is the tests we normally put to truth, the logical consistency, empirical adequacy, and experiential relevance. You're familiar with that. So you start off with the test of logical consistency. You look for empirical adequacy. Is there a way to measure all of this? Is there an existential relevance to it all? Now, if you want to fine tune it a little more, uh, Dr. Geisler carries on a little further with the unaffirmability and undeniability tests and so on. But these three are basic to almost any endeavor, and sooner or later the questions of truth are reduced to one of these three. Is this logically consistent? Is there a point of reference for an empirical test to it? And if not anything else, how is that personally relevant to my life? That's the three part of it. The four part of it is what I put to the four questions to life. Origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. Somewhere along the line, we have to deal with the question of origin. And then the differentiation between good and bad. How do we define these terms? What it is that really brings meaning to my life that I can then stand so boldly upon so as to be able to say, this is the way you must measure meaning in your life as well. In fact, just last week I was in Belgium speaking to the University at Leuven, and the question they wanted me to address is, how do you even define meaning? So when we are talking about man's search for meaning, what are you really trying to pull together in, in, in trying to answer that? What is assumed by the question? So we have these concepts of uh, origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. What happens to a person after he or she dies? That's the four part of it. The three, the logical consistency, empirical adequacy, experiential relevance, moving to origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. And it then covers a wide variety of subjects. God, reality, knowledge, morality, and humankind. Or to put it differently, theology, metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, and anthropology. Now the interesting thing about this is when you and I are defending a worldview, it is assumed by somebody of a contrary worldview that we will be able to cover the, the, the breadth of these five disciplines. How we really deal with the uh, realm of knowledge, with God, with reality, and with morality in humankind. But the naturalist oftentimes will eliminate many of these disciplines and take the single strand of scientific single vision and extrapolate that into a worldview that that's all that's really needed to explain it all. And so I think Stephen Hawking made a huge blunder in the opening chapter of his book 
when he pronounced philosophy as dead. That was quite remarkable, actually, because it brought to bear the whole philosophy department of Cambridge University. And one of the professors there, may I dare suggest that the oracular Professor Hawking has not kept up with philosophy and theology. Those were his very words coming from one of the philosophers at Cambridge University. So you take the three tests, the four areas that have to be addressed, and the five disciplines that need to be covered. When I took that particular grid and placed it on to the study of the new spirituality, it is amazing how unbelievable it was to see where they moved from one discipline to another, how all of a sudden when the thorns of one of them began to prick, they would very quickly move to something else. I can give you example and example of this, of how the internal and the systemic weakness of this whole movement is so readily visible. But let me give it a fair shake and move back to exactly how all of this is seen and how all of this came to be. We often live more within the short-term view. I remember, for example, moving to the West in the 1960s. I was 20 years old when I moved from Delhi to Toronto. I was a brand new believer in Christ. And I was quite amazed shortly after that to see the visit of Maharishi Mahesh Yogi and the popularization of transcendental meditation and all of the teachings that were beginning to come into the Western worldview. And I thought to myself, my goodness, this is where I came from. <laughs> this is exactly what we did every morning when I went to school in Delhi. Whether you, where the yogin would sit up on the platform and tell you how to breathe deeply and, how, and what kind of breathing to do and what to think of while you were breathing thus. And it might interest you, know, that you to know that these days breathing patterns and techniques are being patented. <laughs> if you do two, two short, three long, five longer and this kind of thing, there's a bit of a patent war going on that he's stolen my breathing technique and uh, now he's doing it in 110 degree room temperatures. That was my idea in Bikram Yoga. Why are you going around telling them what I've taught? This kind of stuff is going on. In fact, very recently at the death of, Sa of uh, Sai Baba in Bangalore, one of the leading gurus, you should see what's going on in the court cases now with over a billion dollar empire being split and the lawsuits that have come just as they came after the death of Maharishi Mahesh Yogi and they came after the death of Swami Yogananda as well. But if you go back into the last 30, 40 years and you see the popularization of this under the teaching of uh, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi and TM, it is not that uh, uh, exact to trace it back to his teaching. In the late 1800s, at the Parliament of World Religions, one of the speakers was a man by the name of Swami Vivekananda. Vivekananda is probably the best known uh, architect of explaining the Eastern pantheistic worldview to the West. He was a brilliant man, absolutely brilliant, well-versed, well-studied in Western philosophy. He was the disciple of the very prominent Sri Ramakrishna, and the Ramakrishna mission is still very popular in India today. But Vivekananda, though first not taken by Ramakrishna, finally became enamored by him and was branded as his successor. When he came to the Conference of World Religions in Chicago in 1893, he was not one of the speakers, but he walked up to the microphone, uninvited, and he began his speech with these words, brothers and sisters. As soon as he uttered that, there was a disarming that took place with this man so eloquent in the language and so cordial in the way he was beginning his talk. Then he went on to say this, we who came from the, come from the East have sat here on the platform day after day and have been told in a patronizing way that we ought to accept Christianity because Christian nations are the most prosperous. We look about us and we see England, the most prosperous Christian nation in the world with her foot on the neck of 250 million Asiatics. 
We look back into history and see that the prosperity began with the invasion of Mexico. Christianity wins its prosperity by cutting the throats of its fellow men. At such a price, the Hindu will not have prosperity. I have sat here today and I've heard the height of intolerance. I've heard the creeds of the Muslim applauded when today the Muslim sword is carrying destruction into India. Blood and sword are not for the Hindu whose religion is based on the laws of love. Thunderous applause. Vivekananda swung open the doors of the universities of the West and Eastern spirituality had made its inroads. Now Vivekananda was very smart in the way he handled it. But if you notice right from the beginning, one of the weaknesses in the way he approached this, which was not readily evident to those who wanted to critique the talk, but here it is. Notice how he caricatures Christianity and represents Hinduism in some kind of a pristine monolithic expression. You know, you Christians have done this by slitting the throats of people. Muslim is carrying the sword to India today. We Hindus believe in the laws of love. I wonder what Vivekananda would have said when Graham Staines and his boys in Orissa a few years ago were locked into their van and the van doused with kerosene and a father and his two boys are set ablaze and burned while the Hindu mob gathered around it and cheered. I know exactly what he'd say. That's not Hinduism. All right, then why do you call this Christianity? If you do not judge a system by its abuse, why are you judging the counter perspective by its abuse but defending your own in some of its most pristine expressions? And there's a lot I could say about, about Vivekananda and some of his admiration even for Kali. Uh, if any one of you ever studied the doctrine of Kali, you'll find it to be a very fascinating study. In fact, I had a last chapter to the book called From, uh, from Calicutta to California, but uh, I, had exceeded, I had exceeded my limit by 20,000 words and had to remove that whole chapter and much else. So it'll somewhere in posthumous uh, existence, I guess, be presented uh, in some other book form. But that was Vivekananda. After Vivekananda came this attractive, fine-looking man with the curly locks, Yogananda. Long title to his name. Now, these were not their real names, by the way. Their names are something very ordinary. They're Vivekananda, Yogananda, Ananda, of course, the term for joy, so these titles are given to them. Uh, Yogananda did something that went one beyond Vivekananda. Vivekananda came and clearly trying to show the distinctives between the uh, worldview of the Hindu over against Islam and Christianity and so on. Yogananda came with a big cross on his chest. And what Yogananda tried to do was find some kind of a syncretistic pattern in all of this. It was very subtle, but very likable. And he was a very, very fine man, uh, did not live to be too ripe in his, in his years. And so when Yogananda passed away relatively early, his impact was then divided between other gurus who came on. I think Kriyananda took over from there, and they are still battling it out in the courts as to who really has the right to, to Yogananda's teaching. But if Vivekananda took it in the direction of clear distinctions, Yogananda tried to attempt a syncretistic approach. When Maharishi Mahesh Yogi came, and Yogananda, Vivekananda, fairly contemporaneous, but Maharishi Mahesh Yogi coming around in the 1960s did something beyond this. He basically secularized the practice. You can be a Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist, atheist, whatever, but you can do transcendental meditation. We can get you to these seven states of consciousness so that finally you have reached that blissful state and uh, arrive at this uh, moksha, this release, this transcendental state where you see yourself as identical with this one impersonal absolute and in his techniques and practices which are still uh, practiced in many, many parts of the world. Uh, Deepak Chopra sort of became the, the armor bearer for this whole thing and carried it on and blended it with his knowledge of medicine and so forth, with yogic disciplines, medicine, a little bit of quantum theory thrown into it, which is quite amazing because I remember him dialoguing with Richard Dawkins, and Dawkins says, what on earth has quantum got to do with any of this? And then Chopra quickly retracted and said, well, I use it as a metaphor. <laughs> and Dawkins looked at him and said, metaphor? But 
Chopra believes in this whole thing called quantum healing. The whole thing called quantum healing. How at the subatomic level, if you can find a wellness in that, that part of the universe, how ultimately the particular makeup of your own body can result in healing as well. But that's for another day and another time. You see the three of these gurus in Vivekananda, Yogananda, Maharishi, Mahesh Yogi, one who saw the distinctives, the other who tried to say, make, uh, make this coming all together, and ultimately Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who secularized the whole thing, and in a brilliant marketing move, made it popular in all kinds of settings. Now, what is it that they really believe in the new spirituality? What is it that they are trying to convey to you and to me? Elizabeth Lesser is the best one to articulate this. Let me take you through three ideas she wants to share. The first is the idea of harmony. She really wants to take this individual who is indivisible and bring together that individuality into a harmonious expression. You know, you have to commend many of them because it is at least admitting that there is a contrariness in life within us. There is a brokenness in life within us. What is concerning to me is that people like Lesser and others, once upon a time, were part of an evangelical church somewhere. And came out, came out of it repudiating it all and giving their reasons for it. Her, old, her own life, even after she went into this, fell apart in many ways, but that's, that, that's probably not an unkind way to even look at uh, how to study what it is they are saying. But the harmony she was looking for was in these four areas. If you can bring the mind, the heart, the body, and the soul together, that is Elizabeth Lesser's quest. The harmony of these four uh, manifestations in human life. How can you release yourself from stress and anxiety? How do you deal with grief and pain? How do you return the body to the spiritual fold so that it can heal itself and not be afraid of old age and death? And how can I daily experience the adventure of meaning and mystery? That is her goal. Facing grief, facing sickness, facing the inevitable aging of the body, how can I bring it all to harmonize within a spiritual expression? So she defines spirituality in these terms. Spirituality is an attitude of fearlessness, a sense of adventure. It is a way of looking boldly at the life we have been given here and now on earth as this human being. Who am I? How should I live my life? What happens when I die? Spirituality is nothing more than a brave search for the truth about existence. Nothing more, but nothing less as well. The Buddhist defines spirituality as shamatha, or tranquil abiding. So the goal is to bring the four together, the heart, mind, body, and soul. The process of this that the goal of this is to find this oneness that you have and face life which is sort of uh, protracted pain. It's a life of pain management in effect. And now, what about the practice? How do you come about it? Here's what she says. Sit quietly where you are and close your eyes. Feel yourself breathing. Follow the breath on its journey into and out of your body. Sit feeling yourself breathe for a few minutes. Place your hand over your heart. Then put your hand or fingertips lightly on the spot in the center of your rib cage or to the right of your physical heart. It is the spot you can feel when you are startled and draw your breath sharply inward. Move your hand gently and breathe slowly and softly into that spot until you are focusing intently on what many traditions call the, call the spiritual heart or the heart center. Imagine that the spot you are touching is the top of a deep well. Follow your breath into a journey into the spacious interior of your heart. Breathe slowly, in and out. Let yourself be pulled over more deeply into the well of your, of your own heart. As you meet thoughts and emotions on the journey, do not push them away. They are part of you, not all of you. Greet what you find and move on ever and ever into this deep well of your spiritual heart. Sit in this state, letting yourself be pulled by your longing into the well of your heart, observing your breath for as long as you feel comfortable, and then slowly remove your hand, return to normal breathing, and open 
your eyes. Wow. And so if you go to the ashrams, if you go to the places where this is done, that's precisely what happens. Now, there are different patterns of it. The Zen will take you one way. Uh, the uh, um, Bhakti devotionalist person will take you another way. But I've been to some of these places. I've talked with them. I've interacted with them. And even growing up, you cannot escape this teaching. And I'm not treating it lightly. I'm telling you this is at the heart of what it is they are really searching for. Find a quiet spot. Look inward. Feel yourself the way you really need to be felt. And in the silence of those moments, go deeper and deeper into a meditative state. And then she will go on to describe what it is you will arrive at. Here's what she says. So what is it we believe? It contains the nature-centered traditions of the original peoples of the Americas. It is part science which has underscored for the most part of the 20th century our collective unspoken philosophy. It respects both a mistrust of heavy-handed authority and the willing surrender to a greater power. It draws from the religious teachings of the past, the biblical traditions, the spiritual roots of Africa, the meditative schools of Asia, and the diverse mythic and religious worldviews. And it draws from our own times from the wisdom of psychology, democracy, and feminism. Then she tells you how it needs to move out and solve the problems of the world. The question comes up, what about terrorism? Here's what she says. This actually is Marianne Williamson. For five, minimum five minutes every day, meditate in the following way. Pray that someone even thinking of a terrorist act anywhere in the world will be surrounded by a huge golden egg. Probably are. The eggshell is made of the spiritual equivalent of titanium. It is impenetrable. Any malevolent, hateful, or violent thought that emanates from the mind of the terrorist cannot get past the confines of the eggshell. Before the violent thought can turn into a violent action, it is stopped by the force of this meditative field. Energetically, the terrorist is suddenly quarantined. On the inside of the egg, see a shower of golden light pouring from the eggshell into the heart and mind of the terrorist. Pray for your lost brother. To whom? To whom? Pray for your lost brother. See him or her healed by a force of divine love. Wrapped in the arms of angels, reminding him of who he truly, truly is. Five minutes a day, do this and tell everyone you know we can bring terrorism to an end this way. <laughs> Maharishi Mahesh Yogi wanted to raise one billion dollars and he promised through transcendental meditation he could end terrorism. What does it all boil down to? Here's what I really conclude, and I leave it to you in summary form and begin my response. The tale would go something like this. In the beginning, God. God spoke, but that was a long time ago. We wanted certainty. Now, for this only reason and rationalism would do. But that was not enough. We wanted to see. So we went into the senses and found the empirical. But that's not what we really meant by seeing. What we really meant was feeling. So we found a way to generate feeling into the picture. Truth was framed into a scene, but the scene was left open to interpretation. Scenes are not absolute. So the story was told as an art form. But the, but the reader still didn't like it because he was not the author. So he read the story while he sat in a reconstructed and deconstructed cubicle to make the story whatever he wished. But what does one do with the long reach of the empirical? The best way was to find a blend between the empirical and the satirical and end up with God again. The only difference was that God could not be the storyteller. We still needed God, so we became God. That's it. That's exactly it. The difference between rabid secularism, which evicted God, wanted to move him away so that there was no transcendent voice to address and talk to us about things like sexuality, things like the sacredness of marriage, things that there were boundaries to be set for moral reasoning. Secularism didn't like that. They don't want this over and above. So God is evicted. And in effect, human reasoning is deified. 
But what kind of reasoning? The rationalists came and went. The empiricists came and now returning in some form. The existentialists didn't like either of them. The postmodernists wanted to do away with all of it. What kind of reasoning are we looking at? Because we cannot extinguish the deep hunger that is still within all of us. We still long for that thing we call the, the experience of the divine. The notion of the transcendent. Defining things like love, goodness, evil. So what do we do? Use religious terminology and become the God of God. The only difference between the end story of the secularist and the spiritualist is the fact that we now have become God. The, spirit, the secularist didn't believe in God and acts as God, but doesn't talk about it that way. You know, what happens though is this, friends, and I may be, you know, I, I'm probably a bit of a dinosaur in this in many ways. The power of the visual that has so taken over this world is terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. The visual is supposed to be something magnificent, something beautiful. Uh, my next talk at Founders Week, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the whole Genesis episode, what it is that is intended there. But here is what I wanna say to you that the, the whole sense of beauty, the whole sense of the spectacular that God intended for us has been hijacked now. And the Tower of Babel is not being built in brick and stone. It's in a box in our living room where millions can get idiotized night after night. And the icons of this medium have harnessed a cold medium. Television is, get, don't, don't get mistaken here. Television is a cold medium. It needs to be warmed up. I remember once getting made up for a television program and somebody walking by poked his head into the door and then said to me, uh, preparing the body for viewing, I guess. <laughs> Quite true. Quite true, because you don't want to go in looking like you really do. You want to go in looking like you wish you did. Covering up everything. And so the whole shaping of the media moguls, if you read the biography of Oprah Winfrey, from the time she had, I devoted a whole chapter to her own spiritual journey, from the time she was young, when she was in school, signing autographs, you know, quoting scripture, may Jesus bless you, Jesus is everything, all of this, Till later on in life when she had become such a success, one of her classmates in whose autograph book she'd signed a scripture verse happened to be on a program and caught her completely by surprise and showed her what she'd written there and said, Oprah, what's happened to you? What's happened to you? She was shaping a medium much less than the medium was shaping her. And the end result, people like Gary Zukov and Eckhart Tolle and um, all of the human potential advocates who came and some of whom were peddling stuff that was utterly incomprehensible, like Eckhart Tolle's book, The Power of the Now. My goodness, if the now is all he had, why on earth did he sign a million dollar contract for his book to be delivered in the future? <laughs> they play with games, they play with games, they're word games, and so, the combining with the media as all of this took place, you see what actually happened. And I'll bring this to a funnel point and give my response to you. There's a Greek link, there's a Hindu link, there's a Buddhist link, and there's a Taoist link. And if you really want to track this, I've given two or three examples of a koan from Zen Buddhism. And if you can, if you even just Google the idea of a koan and study what koans mean, it is basically this esoteric use of mystical language, which is so remote to the real situation, you have no idea what on earth they are talking about, but you close your eye and with a lovely smile say, beautiful, that's simply beautiful. Not making any sense of any kind, but evidently somebody smiles and says, that's absolutely beautiful. And so if you don't see the beauty, you've not arrived yet. One of these days you actually will. 
What does Jesus have to say to all of this? What is the struggle of the human heart? Exactly what they're talking about. Bringing this all together. But what does Jesus offer you and me? Very simply, what Jesus offered oftentimes was lost in the church as well. If you go back into the Old Testament, under the young Josiah's rule, when he had the people begin to cleanse the temple, they found what had been lost. They found the book of the law that had been lost in the house of God. When the book of the law is lost in the house of God, people will go looking elsewhere to find a harmony because there is no counter word from above to really explain to you what this world is all about. And the, with the dearth of proper preaching, with the dearth of expository preaching, you know, in, in losing John Stott, we lost one of the greatest ever of all time. Of all time. I remember studying under him here, Craig, you know, and going to lecture after lecture and walking out of there saying, wow, taking the Sermon on the Mount under John Stott. A man, uh, the book has just been released about him, God, Godly Ambition, who spent his life immersed in the word and knew how to plumb the depths of the word and give it to people in bite-sized portions and put all the links together so that at the end of it you saw the whole story. But the book of the law, lost in the house of the Lord. But not only that, you go on in the scriptures and you see Mary and Joseph actively involved in all of the ceremonial celebrations and they forgot where Jesus was. It takes them hours along the journey. Each thought the other person had him. It is possible to lose him in the temple. It's possible to lose him in our families. So busily involved with so many activities, albeit good activities. And many of our children grow up today not really knowing what these truths are, how they need to be defended, how precious they are. And some of them are down at a lower level of the house, all alone sitting in front of a screen with a total stranger occupying their attention. And then the third scene is Jesus is standing in front of Pilate. And Pilate looks at him and says, what is truth? And walks away. We lost him in the house of God. We lost him in our families. We lost him in the political world. Till our leadership no longer knows what Jesus really said about the sanctity of the home and the sanctity of life and the sanctity of sexuality. You know, the loss has been huge, absolutely huge. And the compromise of substance has been immense. We have taken the gathering of masses to be an expression of the authenticity of what it is we are doing. It's not so. I'll tell you, I came to know Christ on a bed of suicide when I was 17. I had no church nearby to go to in Delhi. I didn't know the terms at that point. But I immediately found one little Bible study group and started attending a Monday night Bible study. And the first book we ever studied as teenagers was the book of Romans. And I didn't even know how to study it except my buddy Sundar Krishnan and I, my brother-in-law is a pastor in uh, Rexdale Alliance Church in Toronto today. He was a nuclear physics by profession, physicist by profession, gave that up. He's in the ministry now himself or from an Orthodox Hindu Brahmin background. We were walking by uh, a neighborhood and I saw a garbage dump and I saw a book on top and I picked it up, but the hardcover was gone. It just said if epistle to the com epistle to the book of Raw commentary to the epistle of the book of Romans by W.H. Griffith Thomas. For the life of me, I don't know who owned it in the neighborhood. We picked it up, and thank God it was a conservative, solid commentary on one of these great uh, books of the Bible, and we would study that every Monday night using that as a commentary, and you cut your teeth on the Word of God. You cut your teeth on the Word of God, and then coming here to a place like this, uh, knowing the, 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 the importance of truth, the, 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 the vibrancy of truth, that truth does matter. It absolutely matters. But how you get there, how you communicate, all of this comes along with the growth. And so I, I, I say to you that these are lost over the last 30 to 40 years in many arenas, lost in the, in, in the, in the house of God as it were, lost in the family, lost in the political scene. 
But what is it we are, we are really trying to convey? Very simply, from the book of Ma- Gospel of Matthew chapter 12, Jesus describes as a greater than these three. What, what is he? He's greater than the temple. He's greater than Solomon. He's greater than Jonah. Take those three examples. What is the temple? The temple is a place where we come oftentimes in the east out of fear that if we do not come there and do not know what we are supposed to do, much of that part of the world in these buildings is controlled by fear and superstition. Believe me. You go into the temple of Kali in Calcutta, one of the two temples in India where you still have sacrifices and you can stand for hours in line and you arrive at the front of the stone temple of the goddess Kali. Uh, Calcutta is named after her. Uh, it's actually Kalikatta, the cutting up of Kali and one of the parts of her body fell in that city supposedly and so Calcutta is the home to the temple of Kali. You will see a man standing in front of the statue of Kali with a hand grasping 10 rupee notes, 20 rupee notes, 100 rupee notes, just like that. And people lined up coming, standing in front of that, no more than two to three seconds to just get the darshan, that bowing down, slip that 20 or 100 rupee note into his hand and he just moves them on heartlessly. Come on, move on to get that money. And you look at the masses and you say to yourself, with what conscience do people do this to their fellow human beings? where there's hunger, where there's long. But you know, history, Christendom has done much of the same thing. For many, many years, we were doing the same thing. We can often do the same thing. Fear, superstition, how it controls. And you know, you can go into every part of the Middle East, open the drawer, and you'll see an arrow, an arrow that points to Mecca. Why? Because that's where you bow in that direction and pray. Isn't it marvelous that you and I can be anywhere in the world in any direction, can bow your head and you say, Heavenly Father. He's a greater than a temple. He draws you with cords of love, welcomes you to come to him. And when he had the opportunity to describe the kingdom of heaven, he didn't take a philosopher or a priest. He took a little little child and said, unless you become as one of these. You know, I've recently become a grandfather. I know I don't look it, but I am. (laughs) Corporal once said to Winston Churchill, I've never told you about my grandchildren, have I? He said, no, and I want you to know how much I appreciate it. (laughs) I won't tell you about that. But when you watch a life so closely at this stage in life, yeah, you saw it as a parent, but when you watch it at this stage in life, you watch the total dependence of that infant. Total. Without you, they just are not going to make it. And how that gradual relationship is built completely on trust and need. Completely on trust and need. Except you and I become as one of those. We too shall never enter the kingdom of heaven. For our heavenly father invites us to come and trust. He is greater than the temple. We reach him anywhere. Greater than Solomon. All these one-liners, all these platitudes, all these proverbs that sound very, very good. I don't know how many of you have followed uh, uh, Sri Sri Ravi Shankar in Bangalore. He's got a billion dollar empire. Sri Sri Ravi Shankar will sit for his auditions in the morning that people will come by the thousands and he comes out with these one-liners. One of these one-liners he's very famous for is, your hand must be full and your head must be empty. proves it quite often. The hand is just full. And you know, the people will sit there and say, wow. In, in Hindi, they'll say, vava, vava, wow, wow. And uh, if a person has really said it well, there's a zalim tera jawab nahi, which literally means, oh, maestro, there is no counter response suitable to what you've just said. Your hand must be full and your head must be empty. And these one-liners. The Singapore Straits Times had a whole page in its newspaper of his one-liners. At the end of it, you said, I must be missing something here. (laughs) But they're there. Solomon had them, you know. The only difference was Solomon had some great one-liners and two-liners. 
But you know what Solomon didn't have? He didn't have the inner commitment and discipline to honor them. Who does that for you? Christ is greater than Solomon. He is not just a proponent of great one-liners. He enters into your heart and absolutely <coughs> transforms you so that you hunger after things that God wants you to hunger after and by the enabling power of the Holy Spirit gives you the life to lead and live honoring and pleasing to him. And a greater than Jonah, near death, filled with hate, God conquers a hate-filled people, transforms their heart, and raises this man up, though near dead. He is the Lord of hope. He is the Lord of love. He is the Lord who is able to break past even the most resistant and the hateful heart. This is our Jesus, a greater than a temple, a greater than Solomon, and a greater than Jonah. And I want to give you some time for questions. So I want to close with three thoughts for you here. Number one is this, that when you are dealing with the gospel, when you're dealing with what it is that the gospel actually does, I want to read for you a few things here that I hope will bring this all to a close. When you point out to humankind that the problem and the malady is really not education, the problem and the malady is not really a lack of harmony and so on, that the problem and the malady ultimately boils down to the despicable condition of the human heart. That's what it is all about. You know, I've been in this work for so long and I've been trying desperately and struggling for years to see wherein do we really find the answers to all of this. And the more I travel, the more I see the human condition so depraved, so depraved. I walk through my own homeland and I see what power brokers have done to the world, to the country. In fact, last year, India was in turmoil because they were rising up some people, albeit with undesirable methods, to make laws to stop the country from being so corrupt. One man was fasting unto death to bring in laws because if India ever self-destructs, it'll not be because of lack of intellectual strength. It'll be because there's so much corruption at every level that almost after anything that involves large amounts of money, somebody is in prison at the end of it all. In 2010, December, BBC released its results of a study that it had done year long. What is the greatest crisis on the problem facing humanity? And when the BBC released its study, here's what the news item released. It said for the first time in years, it was not poverty nor environment, which were always one and two. Poverty and environment, always one and two. Now they became two and three. The BBC survey globally revealed, you know what the number one problem was discovered to be? Corruption. Corruption. But also, in an incredible way, some time ago, there was an extraordinary article written by Matthew Paris in, in England, in one of their leading newspapers. And he says something like this. He says, you know, I visited a place of mission watch some missionaries, and he says this, it inspired me in Malawi, where I was raised as a little boy. It renewed my flagging faith in some charities, but travel, traveling in Malawi refreshed another belief too, one I've been trying to banish all my life, because he's an atheist. It confounds my ideological beliefs, stubbornly refuses to fit into my worldview, and it has embarrassed my growing belief that there is no God. Now as a confirmed atheist, I've become convinced of the enormous contribution that Christian evangelism makes in Africa, sharply distinct from the secular NGOs. Education and training alone will not do. In Africa, Christianity changes people's hearts. That alone brings a transformation. I've seen it, the rebirth is real. 
There's long been a fashion among Western academic sociologists for placing tribal value systems within a ring fence beyond, beyond critiques founded in theirs and therefore best for them, authentic and intrinsically worthy as much as ours. I don't follow this. I observe that tribal belief is no more peaceable than ours and that it suppresses individuality. People think collectively. This feeds into the big man and gangster politics of the African city, the exaggerated respect for the swaggering leader and the liberal inability to understand the whole idea of loyal, the loyal opposition, anxiety, Fear of spirits, of ancestors, of nature and the wild strikes deep into the whole structure of rural African thought. A great weight grinds down upon their spirit. It's a heartache to watch this and watch what is being done to Africa. Christianity with its teaching of a direct personal two-way link between the individual and God, unmediated by the collective and unsubordinate to any other human being, smashes straight through the philosophical spiritual framework I've just described. Those who want Africa to walk tall amid 21st century global competition must not kid themselves that providing the material means or even the know-how that accompanies what we call development will make the change. A whole belief system must be first supplanted and I'm afraid it must be, it has to be supplanted by another. Removing Christian evangelism from the African equation may leave the continent at the mercy of a malign fusion of Nike, the witch doctor, the mobile phone, and the machete. Wow. Elizabeth Lesser can talk all she wants about the primitive belief system out there. A scathing critique of that by an atheist and whose own lifestyle is quite inimical to the gospel says, look, I watched what is happening there and I'm telling you, it's going to take the evangelistic message of a changed and a transformed heart. No, not just let's be good to one another. He said the gospel is what Africa needs and may I suggest even more so now, the gospel is what America needs. Number one, transformation. Number two, presence. And my third point, I'll keep brief. You know, I had a very good friend, a man by the name of Nick Charles, who was the first sportscaster that CNN hired. Some of you may have tracked him shortly before he died of cancer. It was about a year ago. And uh, when I first met Nick Charles some years ago in Atlanta, I don't know how it happened, but he was in a meeting where I was speaking, handsome young guy. And he took me aside, he said, can I talk to you? And he looked at me and he said, you know, I'm not, a, actually his family, much of his family is in Chicago. He said, I'm not a good man, Ravi. I'm not a good man. He said, I'm a playboy. He said, I've lived like this. He said, I've lived for pleasure. He said, I'm not trying to hide. He said, all I know is I want to change. I don't like the way I am. One thing led to another. He had given his life to Christ. We became very good friends. He married a beautiful girl, also a producer with CNN, Corey. She, uh, I officiated at their wedding. Some years went by and he said, I need to see you. And I was hoping it wasn't bad news. And he said, I really need to see you. I said, Corey will be with me. So he sat down, he said, Ravi, I'm an older man. He said, I'm, I'm 58 now. And uh, Corey would like to have children. She says, you know, much younger than I am. He said, but I don't want to become a father at this stage. What, what do you want me to do? I said, Nick, this is not fair. Don't put me in the middle of this. He said, no, no, what would you do? I said, I can't tell you what I would do. I can just tell you this. If you deny your wife this great longing of her heart, you'll never be a totally fulfilled man. I said, this is all I can say to you. Two years later, they had a beautiful little girl. Her name is Giovanna. She became the apple of his eye. About two years ago, he contacted me, he said, Ravi, I'm gonna to move to Santa Fe because I'm dying. I said, what are you talking about? He said, cancer of the bladder. The next time I saw him, I looked at him, I didn't even recognize him, he was sitting at the table and he said, Ravi, here. I looked at him and I said, oh my word. He said, yeah, that's what's happened to me. But he went to Santa Fe, he phoned shortly before he died, because I was taking over a seven-week trip. He said, can I see you before you go? I said, I'll come next. So Margie and I flew over. When I walked in, he was just, just like that. His body was so out of control, shaking, and a male nurse sitting by the bed trying to give him some injection to bring the blood pressure under control. He said, please hold my hand. 
and I held his hand. He said, please pray for me, my friend. So I started to pray for Nick. And I could feel his dog, Dante, come over, a labradoodle, big one, just came and nuzzled by my legs here. And his wife, Corey, standing there with her arm around my wife, Margie. And his little daughter just struggling to make sense of all of this. I prayed with him, and as he calmed down, he said, I want to have dinner with you. I said, Nick, you're not in any shape. He said, no, I want to have dinner with you. She got him dressed, we got in the car, went to a nearby reading. He said, I'm going to tell you now. He said, you can make of this whatever you want. He said, a few nights ago, I was lying in bed and I said, Jesus, enough. Enough. Can't handle this anymore. I'm in such pain. He said, please take me home. He said, my little girl lying next to me, my wife. He said, Ravi, I'm telling you the truth. Where you sat on that bed, he said, I sat up and saw at the corner, I saw a figure. I said, someone that reminded me of all that I've ever imagined Jesus to be. He said, I felt that figure come towards me and just say to me, Nick, I will take you home, but not tonight. He said, Ravi, make of it whatever you want. It happened to me. I said, Nick, the most important thing to me is that your Lord met you the way you needed to be met to give you that comfort and that hope beyond what you were going through. He said, I don't fear anymore. I just know I'm going to be with him. I was in Singapore a few days later and uh, my telephone rang 11 o'clock at night as a CNN producer. He said, this story about Nick Charles, what do you make of it? I said, where are you coming from, Greg? He said, oh, I'm a skeptic. I said, what do you think of Nick? He said, he's for real. I said, then take his story to tell you that Christ met him in his need. And I said, I tell you what, Greg, I knew this man in the days where he was living. He said, I know all of that. I said, what do you think of Nick now? He said, he's a changed man. I said, that's the Christ that changed him. That was the last I would see Nick, and he was gone. And CNN and everybody covered that as one of their great heroes. I was overseas when he passed away, so I had to send a videotaping and talked about that transformed heart. Corey still stays in touch with Margie quite regularly. Always grateful for the man that God brought into her life, who God alone was big enough to change and show his presence. And lastly, I say to you, so it's not only the transformation, it's not only the presence, it's the hope. One of my favorite singers is a Scottish tenor, Kenneth McKellar. I listen to him many, many times a week. He sings a beautiful song. It goes like this. Seated one day at the organ, I was weary and ill at ease as my fingers wandered idly over the noisy keys. I know not what I was playing or what I was dreaming then, but I touched one chord of music like the sound of a great amen. It flooded the crimson twilight like the close of an angel's psalm. It lay o'er my feeble spirit like the touch of infinite calm. It quieted pain and sorrow like love overcoming strife. It seemed a harmonious echo from our discordant life. It linked all perplexed meanings into one perfect peace and trembled away into silence as though it was loath to cease. I have sought and I seek it vainly that one lost chord divine which came from the soul of the organ and entered into mine. It may be that death's bright angel will speak in that chord again it may be that only in heaven I shall hear that grand Amen. That's the ultimate harmony when heaven sounds that chord of Amen. It is finished. Every hunger in spirituality is given in Christ. The transformed heart, the presence, and the ultimate harmony for one who's greater than the temple, who's greater than Solomon, 
and who's greater than Jonah. That's our Lord. Carry his message into a world that's hungering to put it all together. May God bless you. Thank you for giving me a hearing. Take about 20 minutes or so for questions. The hour is late, and now is where I must needs go through Samaria, which is my horizontal position, and uh, we'll be back tomorrow morning. But uh, if there's a, well, are there microphones here? Yes, there's one here and one there. Please feel free to go up to that, and if you'll keep your question brief and one to a person, we'll get to as many as we can. Yes, sir. It's, uh, it's the biggest challenge I think we are going, going to face. When you saw, for example, going into the 70s and 80s, when an organization, say like Youth for Christ, began to struggle with drawing audiences into their rallies or whatever it was, uh, what was actually happening was people, kids were being lost much earlier in a much deeper way, the, so that by the time they were 16, 17, and 18, they were, uh, they were so far gone that it was a salvage operation and things like the ordinary programs that we were doing weren't attracting them anymore. They were being lost at the age of 11, 12, 13. And what was happening was that this privatized world in which all the input that they needed was coming to them and uh, the, what loomed before them was all the possibilities in their own little private world. I've now, this year, I'm celebrating 40 years in itinerant ministry. And if I had to do it all over again, even I would do it differently, though I started in the 70s. But certainly now, I wouldn't do it the same way because you're away from your kids so much. And you say, would I, what are the years that, that I have lost in the process? By God's grace, all of my three children are now working with me, and that's just a, a credit to their mother's hard work and the grace of God. So I'm just overwhelmed and thrilled to see them walking with God, but if I still had to do it all over again, I would do it very differently to the way I did it then with the hours and all gone from them. Now, what I want to say to you is this, because of the nature of, of the resistance of the human heart, I had a, a young woman in her high teens come to see me this weekend, last weekend with her father, and it is interesting how deeply they are getting entrenched into an anti-Christian state of mind with their questions. These are kids who may have been raised in the church but suddenly say they can't believe this anymore. The answer is not simple, but they'll bring together many factors that have to be borne in mind. And one of them is this, time. Time with the young ones because you cannot work with your timetable to teach truth. You have to work with their timetable to be available to what I call incidental instruction that's not designed by sit across the couch from me, I'm gonna tell you now what to believe. The incidental nature of instruction is going to have to be coming to the fore, whether it's taking them to a ball game whether it's taking them to something they enjoy doing, but you're right there and having fun in the process and the instruction is coming, which may seem incidental, but is actually framing the character of this person at that time. Time is an indispensable com component. Location is very critical. It's no longer I, you, now you listen to me, I'm gonna tell you, it doesn't work anymore. You have to find the receptive mind at a receptive time and that is often dictated by them. You can't suddenly jump into this, groom this relationship early. Whether it's a telephone call every day to the young one, whether it's an 
text message or an email every day, whether it's a word that I say, I love you, so that they learn to get attached and in need of that affirmation so that if it's ever gone from them, they will truly miss it and long for it. So it has to start early, it has to be on a continuous basis, and it has to be incidental to the locations in which they are very comfortable. Uh, the, the other thing I wanna say is, they get very tired of a judgmental approach of instruction. Be very careful. You have to angle in to application. You cannot go to it in your face. And the last thing I would say, encourage them greatly to be readers, the cyber world notwithstanding. The better readers they are, the more input goes into the mind in a way that gives their imagination sovereignty over the content, the visual, become sovereign over your mind. The audible or the scripted uh, gives them their own imagination strength and uh, the ideas can then provoke greater, greater truths and greater ideas. So I would say as a, as a young dad, take your responsibility very seriously and uh, uh, don't neglect it because the years will go by very, very quickly. Thanks. We'll go alternately maybe, yes sir. When you meet someone who is embedded in a um, relativistic and syncretistic worldview, what is the first thing you say or ask that person to uh, help to dislodge his thinking, to yep. help him to realize that uh, his viewpoint really doesn't make total sense? And well, perhaps I appreciate be... the way you framed your question because really it's more important to ask than to tell. Very important to ask that person. You, the entry point of a discussion is determined by the answers to questions, not just answering unasked questions. If you ask a person a question, why you believe this, what you, what you believe, and so on and so forth, as time goes by, you will begin to understand how this person is really thinking. And there comes a point in every person's belief or a, t a nerve, a sensitive nerve at a certain point to just argue against relativism uh, many of them will just walk away saying, yeah, but that's the way it is, that's what I believe, thanks a lot for your absolutist worldview, but you know, you can have it, it's not for me. But if you see, if you listen carefully, sooner or later a relativist will make a pronouncement against somebody else. And you say to the person, why do you think that's wrong? And the more they open up, they will tell you they have some fundamental assumptions about life where sooner or later individual human dignity is assumed. An assumption that cannot be made in a naturalistic framework. So I would say just be a friend to that person, ask the right questions, show interest. One of the reasons the East has trumped the West, they understood us better than we understood them. They read our languages, they read our books, they read our philosophers. We never bothered anyone of that stuff. And so when we started talking to them about their worldview, some of them could stop and say, now what, do you, what is it you know about my scriptures really? Have you ever opened uh, the Gita or ever read any of this? And so in an institution like this, when those of you who are going to ministry particularly, or even heading out to business, take your course on world religions very seriously. Understand what it is people believe, why they believe it, and it's not just the doctrine side of it. There is a popular side of all of these things. So I would say rather than asking them a question first, I mean answer, answering their questions first, I ask them a lot of questions. And one by one you begin to find they will open up at a point at which you can, sometimes a sharing of your own conversion story, sometimes being there in the time of grief, being there in the time of hurting, you know, when Job's friends went, the problem was that they opened their mouths. Had they not opened their mouths, they would receive much better over a long period of time. And at the end of it, you know, he had to pray for them because of all the answers they had without ever pausing to ask him how he was really feeling about this, how he was coping through that. So I would say there's a Job in every human being. Make sure you're listening and ask the right questions before just jumping into the answers. Yeah. Yes, sir. Good evening, Dr. Zacharias. My name is Nestor Soriano, and I just wanted to express my appreciation for your ministry. I've been following it for about seven or eight years. I'm a pastor in the Seventh-day Adventist Church and also a student at our seminary uh, at Andrews University. In fact, we have many students from there. And my question, that's right, my question is this. Um, I'm sure that there are a, a variety of Christian denominations here, 
how do you explain to unbelievers the fractions within Christianity? And I'm speaking about the plurality of the denominations that we have within our own, uh, within our, with our own system of belief within, within Christianity, when we are supposed to have an exclusive and united message. Okay. I was at, the, at Michigan State University when I saw on video. It's actually quite funny. A Muslim guy stood up and basically said to me, he said, you know, you Christians have all these denominations and so on, you know, it's because Jesus taught in parables, it's so inexact, and he went on and on and on. I said, we Christians have so many denominations? I said, my goodness, the Sunnis and the Shias and the Druze and the Ahmadiyyas and the Sufis, and then he started laughing. I said, you've got all these groups. I said, you know why? Because any time in my worldview, in our worldview, if you have something that is genuine, you will always have something that is counterfeit. I said, so don't attack what we have to be, well, why we are so many groups. If you're going to attack, attack the genuine and ask me what it is we believe and I'll be happy to answer it. Now, in terms of the Christian denominational differences, the way I look at it is this. There are two errors you can make. One is an error in form and the other is a corruption of substance. An error in form and a corruption of substance. Errors in forms are less serious, but corruptions of substance are very serious. And sometimes you may have these various expressions because personality-wise, some person may prefer a certain expression of worship. I'm much more a traditionalist type of guy. I was raised in the Anglican Church in Delhi, although I never listened to a word when I was there. But after I came to know the Lord, uh, now I've got an Anglican prayer bench in my study. I get to my knees every morning. I read the, the, uh, the, the prayer book and so on. I love all of that. Uh, I'm a traditionalist. Somebody else may be more of a happy clappy type, you know, they might enjoy that type of thing. And uh, you know what? I, I speak in many of their churches and when I sit on the platform, they just wonder, is this the guy who's gonna speak to us? You know, I mean, I, I, it's not my expression but I allow the privilege of the person whose personality wants that kind of expression. That's a form. And if there are formal errors that are made, we can talk about it, we can discuss it. But where we really need to discuss is the substantive differences. Is there a corruption of substance? And if there is a corruption of substance which principally applies to the person and the work of Jesus Christ, then you have to say, this person may call themselves a Christian denomination, but they've really departed from the historic Christian faith, mm -hmm. and therefore that becomes a very serious corruption. So I, I say to people, if there are formal differences, we learn to live with it. Somebody might like this kind of soloist or music, that kind of worship and so on. God has created us with the diversity of personalities. But at the same time, we have to guard our doctrine. And that's when the differences may become serious. So I say you have to examine it on the basis of the historic Christian faith and what it particularly says about the person, the work of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes. Um, I was just wondering if very briefly, because you said you only have 20 minutes. Yeah. Um, well, we'll just take these three and these three here. I'll keep my answers brief, yeah. Um, I was just wondering if you could very briefly cover um, how exactly does Christianity line up with your three, four, five? Because when you were explaining the three, it didn't seem as though Christianity really lined up with at least two of those. Which one? Um, I know that it lines up with logical consistency, but the other two, which had to do with some bit of hypnotic. Empirical adequacy and experiential relevance? Okay, the last one it also applies to. The second one I question a little bit. Sorry? The second one I question a little bit. Empirical so. adequacy? Okay, fair enough. You see, now uh, that's, that's fascinating that you would say that, and obviously it's coming from your heart and you think that way. When you look at the Quran, okay, take the, take the Quran, take the Bhagavad Gita or the Vedas or something, or you take the three pitakas of uh, Buddhism, whatever, and you put the Bible next to it. There are so many key distinctives in the Bible over against the others. Hindus will describe their beliefs, many of them as Hindu mythology. Many of their historic narratives are called mythology. They don't believe in the historicity of those things. They just believe these are stories made up. Uh, some of them will say, yeah, the, how did uh, Ganesh get his elephant head? 
you know, and the story is, of course, of the, his father coming back and uh, uh, he got angry at a moment and vowed he would cut off the head of the first person that he saw and unfortunately cut off his son's head. So the next thing he saw was an elephant. He cut off the elephant head and put it on top of his son and that's how Ganesh became the Lord Ganesha and so on. Now, some will say, well, yeah, there is a lot of truth to that. I don't understand it, but it's true. But many others will say, this is all mythological. The Bible is a book of history. So it is verifiable. I remember many, many years ago, reading in books on archaeology, I remember even uh, uh, going back and seeing that one of the critics that were made, criticisms that was made of the passion of our Lord, is that there is no reference to Pontius Pilate anywhere in any other place outside of the New Testament. How could somebody who actually made it into one of the creeds and then referred to as such a key figure in the crucifixion saga, not mentioned anywhere else. Today, if you go to Tiberius, you'll see a huge stone with the marking of, uh, of Pontius Pilate on it, and now the actual one is put in the shrine of the book, and the replica still remains out there. Now, what was happening at that point? What was happening at that point, the critic was saying, where's the empirical evidence for this kind of stuff? So that's the verifiable historic fact. And then the experiential relevance side of it, you have to talk about it, is that when you worship, worship is fulfilling the ultimate longing in the human heart to bring together unity and diversity. Unity and diversity was what the Greeks hungered for. And so in worship, in the worship of the living God, the harnessing of the sacred that binds together all of the proclivities and all of the passions and desires you have, giving that the sacred underpinning, giving that the sacred cohesion, that's the coherence, that's the relevance that it brings. So that if you take, for example, sexuality in gay abandon, as it were, the Allah, whatever you want to do, there is no meaning in, the, in, 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 in its expression of it. But if you take sexuality in the binding, say, of, of the sanctity of marriage as given in the scriptures, it does become relevant. So there is both empirical measurement and personal relevance, but your point is fascinating in raising that because in talking to people today, if you just talk truth without relevance, then you end up with something that is not connecting with the person's need. I also misunderstood your, empiric your empirical part to be empiricism, which is also a bit of that as well. Which one is that? Oh, I also misunderstood empirical to mean empiricism, which oh, okay. is a bit Oh, okay, well, different. all right. <laughs> em empiricism has empirical in it, yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Uh, good evening. Uh, just also first, thank you for the work that you do. Um, thank you. It means a lot. Um, I study apologetics and I study theology and I'm at a secular university. And I've heard you speak several times about travels and the different people you talk with. One of the things that I come across um, is that in apologetics, as you study theology, there, there's this sense of sort of being weary of being on the defense as you live life. Um, Every book I read, everything I encounter, every message that comes across is, is a little nick and it moves you and it, and it changes perspective. And um, as you've traveled and as you've been all over the globe, and I remember you said something once, uh, possibly you may recall it, that even just changing a location sometimes make you, makes you doubt certain things. And I know for me and for a lot of Christians, there is this sense of being tired and weary of being on the defense. Um, where do we begin to address that? Thank you for being very honest. Uh, and of course, the Bible alerts us not to get weary in well-doing. And in the book of Malachi, one of the last verses, it says, you've also snuffed at it and said, behold, what a weariness it is. This sense of emotional, spiritual, physical fatigue is very real. And in our line of work, you know, we mainly go to hostile audiences. You're sort of seen as a dartboard when you come, and they're really there to get you. <clears throat> The most important thing I say to you is this. Always feed your soul in a balanced way, not just the intellect. <coughs> I read a man by the name of F.W. Boreham, B-O-R-E-H-A-M. Until about a couple of years ago, I carried his books all the time and read an essay every day by Boreham. Because Boreham sees the sublime and the simple he was a devotional writer. 
And I would always begin every day by reading a chapter from Borom, then go to the scriptures, and then uh, uh, my time of prayer. I'm hoping again, by the middle of the year, to pick that up once more, but I have read all of his 55 volumes, so I'm just taking a bit of a break in it and gonna go back to it again. Find a way to feed your soul, where you are being nurtured, not just intellectually, but in the devotional side of your life. The second thing I would encourage you to do I have a group of five people, four men and one woman, one there, three of them are on my board, two of them are friends, who are in my personal accountability group. I stay in touch with them regularly, share with them. One of them is here tonight. I just wrote to them uh, recently. And what I am open to them about is, if you see anything wrong with me, you need to correct me, please write to me, call me, say something. And Paul is here tonight, he lives in Chicago, and I write to them after meetings, I write to them when I'm struggling, I write to them when I'm making difficult decisions. And uh, I think it's very important that those who love you hear from you and that you hear from them. Yeah, my family does, I have them of course, my wife and my children, they are always my best friends. But I like to have a group of people to whom when I'm heavy hearted I can write, say please pray for me and I'm just going into this meeting, I need some prayer, please do that for me, stand with me. So do some reading, have people with whom you can stay in touch with and close it, and then you have others who incidentally you just stay in touch with and get advice from. I would say to you, if your prayer life is guided every day with an undying discipline and your reading is balanced, and your friends are there to stand with you, you will not always feel under attack. You will feel upheld, you will feel sustained. <coughs> One of the things I ask my wife to do is, please don't send me into the lion's den back to back. You know, she takes all my bookings and I don't like doing two or three university open forums back to back because you come away saying, the whole world hates this, you know? <laughs> it's not the way it is. But if you can go to a missionary conference after that and hear some wonderful stories, uh, it's, uh, today I got a letter from my colleague Michael Ramsden who's at Gordon College the last two days and one of my colleagues, uh, Bob Grinnell is here, who is, uh, two of them are here actually from my team who are with him. They say the meeting went on past midnight yesterday and Michael got back to his room at 3.30 a.m. People coming to the front, repenting, broken into tears. My colleague from England wrote and said, you'd never believe what's happened at our meeting last night. And Michael sent those to me with the words, for your encouragement. It's good to get that, you know, and I say, wow, thank you, Lord. So don't get weary. You know, you may get weary in it, but don't get weary of it. And uh, uh, God's doing some things in the other parts of the world and many other parts of the world which will make you hold on to the rafters, you know. It's fantastic. Quickly, two, two. Thanks. Yeah. Yes, sir. Hi, brother. Um, I'm here on behalf of a very close friend back home who has recently walked away from the faith. And so... I called him, I decided to give it a shot and just ask him, is there any question you'd like me to ask Ravi Zacharias tonight? Because he was very interested in you and studied some of your stuff. Um, and, and so he said yes. Um, Thanks for the, doing that. <laughs> yeah. He said the reason um, why, this is Tom speaking, why I walked away from the faith was that I started to um, wrestle with the fact that God chooses some and not others. And then I had to deal with it on a personal level asking, what if God didn't choose me? And if we're doing evangelism, it's okay, Steve. God didn't choose that person, I guess. And so wrestling with that on a personal level with appreciation for the worth and the value of a human being. And so I started to you know, try to talk with him, but I don't know my stuff. Um, <laughs> and, and so I was wondering, you know, I feel like I sense that this might be a different question, but that Tom has been kind of poisoned with this dichotomy between um, free will and God's sovereignty and choosing some and not others. And he's really wondering, do I have a choice? Do I have a choice to accept Christ? And so what would you well, say? You're in the right place, you should enroll out here. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'll be happy to give you a two or three minute answer. And uh, it's one of those answers, no matter what you say, somebody's gonna hate you for it. <laughs> but uh, if you get onto our website, we give you articles and essays on both sides of the issue, to be mm -hmm. fair. So I'll give you my simple answer to that, and I'm not sure it'll be fully satisfying to your friend. 
I actually have to wonder whether that's the real problem with him. I think it's just a symptomatic thing. I doubt it's the real problem. You know, like Oprah Winfrey said, she walked away from the faith when she heard her pastor preach a sermon on God being a jealous God. Really? That's why you walked away from the faith? You didn't even understand what the terms of an exclusive love really means and the nature of love and so on and so forth? Or was that just an excuse to walk away from certain, maybe other unanswered questions? So if it is of any comfort to your friend, at least take this approach. The Bible holds both of these points in tension without exclusion. It holds both of these in tension without exclusion. That which God had foreordained from before the foundation of the world, you with wicked hands have taken and crucified, the Apostle Peter. Apostle Paul, work out your own salvation, for it is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Jesus himself, offenses must come, but woe unto him through whom they come. There's a point in which these two are held in tension. And God, I think, purposely leaves us in the mystery of recognizing that without him, I would never make it, but he calls upon me to follow him. Okay. So you have to hold these two. You don't know where one ends and the other begins. I like Oz Guinness's answer when we were in uh, Atlanta together for an open forum, where he talked, uh, I don't know if I'll say it as well as you do, Oz, but he quoted Francis Schaeffer at saying, if one holds to one and one holds to the other, and one holding to the other is ignoring the one, and one holding the one is ignoring the other, give them the opposite perspective of what it's, that's what they need for the moment, and give them that perspective to counterbalance the extreme to which they have gone. If one is holding totally to an absolute free will, you have to remind them of the sovereignty of God. If one is so clinging to the sovereignty of God that they claim no responsibility to the free will, you better remind them of the free will. So it all depends on the medication needed for the moment because we know that both are true and God in his mystery keeps us from knowing where one line ends and the other begins, but we know they are both there. No different to the incarnation, by the way. Very God of very God, very man of very man. Both are held together, and God leaves that divine mystery for us without, uh, you know, well, what was it Gabriel Marcel said? There's a difference between a problem and a mystery. Getting to Mars is a problem. Falling in love is a mystery. And he said, a mystery is a problem that encroaches upon itself. So for one to say, if I'm not chosen by God, then I'm not free, he's encroached upon the problem by freely saying that he is not free. So it's a mystery that pulls himself into the very dilemma. Keep them in balance. Tell your friend to get on. I mean, actually, you can get a lot of books on the subject here. I think uh, J.I. Packer's book, Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God, is one of the great all-time simple little books on that to take. Tell your friend we wish him well, and we hope one day he will know the sovereign God has called him to himself too. Okay? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Zacharias. And we appreciate the work you do, especially on secular universities. Yeah. Um, my question is, the Bible states that only God is immortal. God, is, God immortal. is what? Immortal. Okay. And uh, when you read, uh, let's say, New Age writings and uh, Eastern writings, you find that one of the fundamental premise is that uh, the soul also is immortal. And uh, so there is this uh, struggle to reach the, the soul. And so who are we as Christians to especially attack or question them, especially if we teach also that the soul never dies, that when a person dies, go, to, go straight to heaven? The answer to that is very simple. They are mixing up two words. One is an uncreated entity, and the other is a created entity. There never was a time where God wasn't. But there is a time where that individual <coughs> wasn't. And so to say that the soul lives on eternally is not therefore to say that the soul has existed through eternity. But that is true of God, it is not true of human beings. So there's a difference in the two categories. Okay. Yeah. Good evening, sir. Looking back on your uh, years of study, uh, ministry, um, speaking to both friendly and hostile crowds, writing books and such, um, I think one of the other questions might have touched on this. What is the one piece of advice you would give to those who are following in your footsteps? Wow. First of all, I hope they would choose somebody else's footsteps to follow. <laughs> I'm serious. That is, uh, yeah, they've got better people to follow. 
it's hard to reduce something so significant to one statement. So if you'll allow me the privilege of saying a couple of things. Number one is this. I said this, I think, the last time I was here, or the time before last. Calling and equipment are two different things. You can be gifted in a certain way, and if your calling matches your gift, it's a beautiful combination. If you go into a calling without a gift, it's miserable for you and the audience. If, it's, uh, if you just have a gift but with no calling, you're just wasting all that God has poured into you. So I would say identify the combination of the gift and your calling. It's very important. Your professors and your classmates will help you a lot in that. If they, if they recognize a giftedness in you, they will encourage you and tell you to nurture that gift, to feed that gift, to develop that gift. And uh, I can guarantee you if you honor God in that gift, he will bring somebody into your path or a situation into your path where he leads you into his call and confirms it. But the second thing I would say to you is probably the most important thing I would say. Wherever he calls you, whatever he equips you with, if you don't have a humble spirit and a humble heart, you will squander or abuse what it is that God has given to you. This is, you know, the old joke about the guy who said, I was going to speak on humility, but I'm going to save it for a larger audience. <laughs> so, it's it's uh, that kind of common malady. And I think this thing called hubris, pride, it's, it's a deadly thing. I see it again and again and again. It's uh, you just hope and pray that if anybody sees it in you, that they will caution you or God, they will caution me or say, that's not coming through well, you know. It sounds a lot like a very confident, egotistical person. Then you have to take a step back and say, I'm sorry, I didn't intend it that way. Because this very voice that you have can go like that. Go like that. I think of Samuel Taylor Coleridge. My work in Cambridge for the brief stint I did there was in the Romantic Writers. Samuel Taylor Coleridge is a brilliant poet. He squandered it away with drugs and all of that till he couldn't write anymore. And he sat in his room one day desperately for an hour or two, hoping he could at least frame one stanza in the caliber that he was used to. And he put that quill down and wept and he said, it's gone. Uh, gifting can be squandered and humility can plunder the soul. Uh, the lack of humility can plunder the soul. So I would say to you, be a humble person, find your gifting and calling, and use it for the glory of God, knowing it's all of him. He just happens to have chosen you for that moment and that time. He could have called anybody else to do it. Okay, thank you. Last one. Hi. I am a recent married person <laughs> to my wife, Sarah. <laughs> And uh, I want to ask a question about prayer and devotionals. And so I've had a hard time with prayer and devotionals, just kind of getting in a good routine. And I'm a very committed Christian. I used to be a youth pastor for a time. And when we got married, I devoted myself to studying again, to classwork. And so I just want to know, how can I perhaps get a good balance now, your view? Good balance between? between having prayer and Bible study. How long have you been married, you said? Four months. Wow. <laughs> Story is told of the guy who flew his wife to Hawaii for the 25th anniversary. Somebody said to him, wow, for the 25th, what are you planning to do for the 50th? He said, fly her back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get killed for that. No. As a matter of fact, this is, in May, is going to be my 40th. And uh, when, we, when we came to Toronto, when we came to Trinity, we were newlyweds. We were married in 72, and we came to Trinity in 73. 73. So we have some very happy memories here, Craig, and our little one was born while we were here. Uh, first of all, I want to say to you, Outside of that 
relationship you have with Jesus Christ, the relationship you have with your wife is going to be the most important thing in life for you. She'll be your best critic. She'll be your best friend. And always be prepared to take her criticism because many people will never tell you things that she alone will have the courage to tell you. And you must, uh, if you're a youth pastor and you're up in front, you're going to say many a thing that probably you ought not to have said. Mm -hmm. And if she's the one who's telling you that, you better take it seriously. I would never have made it this far without a wife who's twice as committed to the Lord as I am. And I mean that very sincerely. So God bless you and I wish you every success in your home and in your ministry. The balance between the Bible, Bible study and the word, Bible study and prayer is very clearly impression and expression. You know, an expression of words without an input, input of ideas will lead to conceptual bankruptcy. You have to have an input coming in, coming in, and the word of God is going to give you that input. The second thing I say to you is, however you form your prayer life, make it something that you guard. You must guard it, because there'll be many other things that'll invade that time for you. You know, I'm an early morning person. My wife's a late night person. She has her time in the evening with the Lord. I have my time early morning. And then, of course, when we are together, we have our time. But I want to suggest to you that whether you're an early morning or a late night person, in the ministry, you better start your day with some time with the Lord. Because I find if I don't start it with the Lord that morning, I see him through the world's eyes. If I started with him, I see the world through his eyes. So I say to you, however you do it, and my way of suggesting it is that sometimes you start reading the word and your mind is still half asleep. Use something else to wake you up. That's why I read Borom. He wakes me up. And then I go to the word and I don't lose anything from that word at all. He wakes me up, I get to the word, and I get to my time of prayer. May I also suggest a hymn book? or a songbook in the combination of that reading and prayer so that you've got the imagination stirred and the music in your heart and the melody that you need to make unto the Lord. So keep it up. God bless you. It's wonderful you're starting out your life this way. Thank Please you. forgive that joke. I just couldn't resist that. God bless you. Take care. Okay. Well, I think we're all convinced that Ravi Zachariah is both called and gifted, and we are grateful to God for that, and we're grateful to you for being a good steward of that calling and that giftedness, and sharing that with us tonight, and we'll look forward tomorrow morning of hearing more at 11 o'clock. He'll be speaking on the topic, if the foundations be destroyed, so I hope some of you, most of you will be able to be back for that, and then tomorrow afternoon at 3 p.m. with Oz Guinness. <laughs> You know, I can't help but think before we close and we'll, we'll stand for prayer in a moment, that there, there may be some here who are, they, they've heard this and it, it sounds so too good to be true. And you're saying, how can that really be that a person can come to know God in that kind of a way with that kind of conviction and that kind of inner peace and, and to really know God in this, how does that work with Jesus? And I would be uh, sorry to see anybody go home without getting more answers to those kind of questions. And I know that some of us are here. Ravi will be here, I think, for a little while. Um, and others of us who would love to talk to you more, if you have that kind of a question, don't, don't go home without getting that answered. So uh, that's uh, just an invitation to you to keep asking these questions and following up on these issues. Go to the webpage at rzim.org, I believe it is. You'll find all kinds of interesting uh, information there and videos and audio and so on and so forth. Well, will you uh, stand with me and let's close our evening in prayer. Our most gracious Lord, how very good it is to know that you are a God who has spoken into our world, that we are not left to grope on our own, and that you are a God who has acted and your love became visible tangible in the sending of your son to be born in a time and place to be nailed to a real wooden cross 
to be buried and to truly in history be resurrected from the dead and to conquer death. And we thank you that he brings us life and that this is true and we can experience it and you've confirmed it over and over again. And we thank you for what we've heard tonight. And we pray that you will keep us strong in seeking truth and seeking you and living for you. Help us to be those who can communicate clearly with others who are searching, who are asking questions. We thank you for your goodness in every way to us that we've experienced even on this evening. And now may you send us off with your grace and peace. Protect those who have long journeys ahead of them tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.